Welcome to the Dragon's Library, your source for games, movies, shows, and more. Hello everybody! Welcome back to the Dragon's Library. Today we get to talk about something with an actual dragon in it! Yay! And it's a Marvel movie. Even more yay! So, uh... <laughs> uh I'm, I'm an idiot. Alright, <laughs> so... Today we're talking about Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, it might be one of my new favorite Marvel movies, to be fair. Like, it's probably, def it's definitely up in the top ten. It might be in my top five, or just outside my top five. Uh, which is saying something, since there are like, what, 20 of these things right now? 26 or something like that? Uh, let's see, what, which one is it? Uh, 20... Ah, uh, do 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 Twenty fifth film. It's the twenty fifth film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. Very much recommend it. The, that as my initial review. Yes, I'm going to heavily recommend this movie. If you haven't seen it, you know, go see it. It's pretty cool. Uh, of course, only if you can do it safely. I know a lot of people, you know, can't go to theaters yet. That's just how it is. Um. I went on, like, late on a Thursday night and had a whole seat to myself, so, along with, you know, the seats next to me, there weren't that many people there, so, you know, that was nice. Um, as for the movie itself, really good effects, Marvel is, you know, like I said in my Black Widow review, Marvel has this down to a science, this is definitely one of their, uh, better, uh, movies, definitely, I would highly recommend it over most of their stuff. It's an improvement for Phase 4 over Black Widow. Like, there wasn't anything wrong with Black Widow. It was an above-average action movie. But for Marvel, it kind of felt like a step down. Because they're, they're, when they're on their game, they're a lot better than this. So, um, I went into this, you know, partially excited. Because, again, I knew there was going to be a dragon in it. And I'm all for dragons. And also because it just looked like they were trying to do something interesting. It's not. It's a pretty obscure character. It also looked like they were trying to do something with the uh, whole Mandarin thing from Iron Man 3. Um, also, look, this review is not only going to have spoilers for Shang-Chi after a certain point. It's also going to have uh, spoilers from Iron Man 3. Because uh, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, a character from Iron Man 3 who we had not seen for a long time pops up again. And he's a lot of fun. So I'm going to be talking about him a lot. But that's safe for the spoiler section. For now, as you know, Marvel has these effects really well. Uh, in particular, I want to mention the dragon. I just loved all the effects with him. The Great Protector was amazing. Uh, the demon is a kind of interesting design. It's like a bat Lovecraftian nightmare thing, which is pretty cool. Um, what can I get to without any spoilers? I think they took a very standard kind of plot. You know, hey, he's the heir to a, a group of ninja warriors, and his father is... You know, father had him try to do something horrible, and then he left, uh, and now he's being dragged back into the light by his father because he wants him to come, you know, come back. I think they managed to subvert a lot of my expectations with this. I expected it to go in a very specific direction, and it didn't. It actually kind of uh, did something a lot more interesting, and it managed to humanize some of the characters in ways I didn't expect them to. Uh, in particular, the villain. I have to say this is one of their better villains. He's not like Killmonger or later Loki stuff. But he's definitely up there. Uh, I place him, like, right below, like, the, you know, the top three Marvel villains are Thanos, Loki, and uh, Killmonger. And I'd probably put him right below there. Maybe one or two other villains might, might be able to challenge him. Um, but he's pretty high up there, actually. I really like the, what they did with the villain. He comes off a lot more tragic than a lot of the other, you know, nameless, faceless CGI army kind of villains. In addition, the effects are just generally good. There's a lot of references to what I assume is Chinese mythology. Although, unlike basically every other time I've run to mythology in a review, I actually can't give much uh, commentary on Chinese mythology because it's one of the few I haven't studied that much. I It's a little weird. I've reviewed, like, I've done a lot of, like, uh, research into Greek and Rome, Greek, Greek and Roman mythology, Mesopotamian mythology. Babylonian, you know, Mesopotamian, Babylonian, um, Mesoamerican, even some Native American stuff. And I have done some Japanese mythology, but I actually have never really done that much Chinese mythology. Um, my experience with it is mostly from stuff I read about in Journey to the West. And some basic things like dragon pearls and uh, the symbolism of dragons, that kind of thing. But it's always in a very vague, I understand the 
general concept, but I don't understand the reference kind of way. Um, so I actually can't do that much comment on a lot of the mythological creatures we see in like the uh, other reality they end up going to at one point. So I'll leave that for someone else to do. I wish I could go through it. I will probably be looking into more, some more Chinese mythology. Um, to conclude the spoiler-free section of this review, um, the actors are all good. I think uh, Simu, Simu Lai, Simu Li, Liu, Simu, Simu Li, Liu, uh, he's the guy who plays shang Chi. I think he does a really good job. Uh, he comes, you know, comes off very, very, uh, very well. Ka- the actress, oh, I forget her name. The actress who plays Caddy, uh, she's, uh, she's, she's like the main character's uh, best friend. They have a really good dynamic together. Like, I genuinely want to see them because they, at the end of the movie, uh, minor spoilers, of course they survive because they're at the front billing and they go off to, you know, have more adventures. That's like the sort of ending. I'm not going to spoil anything, but that's the general idea. Um, and I genuinely do want to see more stuff with them. They have a really good dynamic together. <clears throat> the sister, um, Jai Ling, or the actress who plays Jai Ling, um, is really good as well. She's different enough from her brother, and again, I think they took her in an interesting direction I wasn't expecting to. Like, this feels like a stock movie at first. Like, you know, everything in the place is like, okay, here's the crime boss father, here's the talented kung fu son, here's the ignored daughter. Uh, and they take it in a more interesting direction than I originally ascended. Again, I'll get more into that in the spoiler section. So, yeah. Um, also, for those of you who did want to know, minor spoiler ahead. This is where we start going to spoiler talk, but I'm not going to get quite there yet. This is really small. We do get to see Wong in this. So, if you're a big Wong fan from the uh, Doctor Strange or Endgame, you're going to like this. Uh, he's a lot of fun in the role. He's great. The actor they have for Wong is just amazing. Love it. Uh, so, you know, great job. So, yeah. That's basically it for the non-spoilers. I highly recommend you go see the movie if you get a chance. If not, it'll be on Disney Plus and it'll be on Disney Plus pretty soon, so check it out. Alright. Everybody gone who doesn't want to hear spoilers? Cool. Okay, so this is just really good. Like, seriously, just all hands on deck. This is just a really good, solid movie for what it is. Like, even without the Marvel connections, I think this is still a top-tier movie. And it also shows off a lot of the strengths of the Marvel Cinematic Universe as a setting more so than a connected universe. Basically, the benefit of having the Marvel Cinematic Universe is um, you can basically just have random wizards or mutate mutants just popping up randomly throughout the book. Like, okay, to explain what I mean, there's a point where they go to find uh, his sister. It's like right after the first major fight scene. They go to uh, Macau to go find his sister, Jai Ling, who he's been separated from. And they find out she's running, like, this meta-human fight club. And we see, like, the extremist soldier, some, you know, gener- more general, like, you know, t- the, for the people from Iron Man 3, the extremists, like, exploding people. We see some uh, wizards. We see a few mutated people. We see a few people just random superpowers that look like they could have belonged to the list from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And in general, it's like, Oh, right, this is a world where superpowers exist, and there are a lot of D, C, and B tier list superheroes and supervillains who aren't exactly in prison and, you know, might not be too dangerous, so they might make some money, you know, getting some fights in. And we find, and we see, like, Wong fighting the Abomination. A lot of people have been guessing, no, that's gonna happen though, because it was in one of the trailers. Uh, it is Wong, and he is actually fighting the Abomination, who looks a lot better. He looks a lot cooler. He looks closer to what I think, uh, his comic book design is. He has, like, these little frills on the side of his head now. And he's kind of cool. I do want to see him in another, like, Hulk movie or something like that, because he actually has a good design now. Um, and apparently Wong has been, like, breaking him out of prison so that he can go in sparring matches with him, you know, for money. And it's like, okay, Wong, it's like, it's like, make sure you work on that right hook. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> I want to know, the, I want to know what's going on there. Uh, <laughs> but that's, like, the benefit of the uh, cinematic universe, in my opinion. They basically say, hey, this is Wong. You all know him from, you know, uh, Doctor Strange. Here's the Abomination from uh, Hulk. We, he's a really cool monster. If you want to know more about him, go watch that old Hulk movie. And if you want to know about, more about Wong, you can go watch, a, you know, Doctor Strange or, uh, you know, Endgame. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. And they're just casual references to the snap or something like that. It makes this world feel very alive, but it also gives us tangible answers to what all these things are. Like, they don't have to make a side movie for saying she just describing what they meant by 
somebody could just snap their fingers and have the world stop exist. They already made that movie. It was an actual good movie, and this is just referencing it as some event that took place in their world. And I find that that is very compelling and makes it these, like, really interesting world um, for them to explore. Like, to understand, this has ninja crime family run by an immortal. It's basically Ra's al Ghul. It's basically just, like, the Ra's al Ghul plot taken seriously in the Batman movie. So, for those of you who haven't seen the Dark Knight trilogy, in uh, the first one, there's the first one chronologically, I forget exactly the order. Uh, I only really remember Heat Ledger's Joker in that entire movie. That one was great. Uh, but when they had Rachel Ghoul appear, they had him, like, pretending to be an immortal who was running this terrorist organization, Ninja, for, like, you know, millions of years. But it turned out, no, he's just a guy who fakes being immortal. And it's like, okay, well, that's kind of dumb. Like, Rachel Ghoul's whole thing is that he's reborn through the Lazarus Pits and it might have been mentally unstable and he's amassed this wealth and power and skills, uh, you know, loyal cult of assassins over thousands of years and that experience will make him dangerous. And they actually commit to that in Shang-Chi. His father is immortal. The the rings, the armbands, specifically the rings, are powerful artifacts he either found or stole. It, they don't make it clear. Um, and while he's wearing them, he stops aging. It also gives him superpowers. And so he's lived for over a thousand years. There's even a funny moment where he's like, meet, they're, they're talking, you know, face to face with two armies. And the old, the old wise member of the village is like, you should back away from this. It's like, do not talk down to me, boy. It's like, oh, right. This guy is, he's in, I've lived 10 of your lifetimes. It's like, oh, right. To him, he is an overgrown child. Uh, and it does add to him. He's, he feels like someone who has the resources to do almost anything. Uh, and kind of makes his backstory even more tragic, in my opinion. Uh, since we're in full spoilers, I also want to talk about the villain, um, <clears throat> which is Wen Wu. He's the leader of the Ten Rings. Uh, he's played by Tony Leung, I believe is that how you pronounce that. I'm horrible. I apologize for my pronunciation of all Chinese names in this. Uh, I seriously highly uh, apologize for him. I'm not the best at pronunciation of, like, anything. Anyway... Um, with him, he's basically a uh, Chi Chinese warlord who found the rings and used it to amass wealth and power over thousands of years and has his own loyal army of assassins. You know, one of the many people who sits back and tries to manipulate the world's events, sort of like Hydra and a lot of others have. Uh, I wonder if these guys ever get into fights over the direction the world should take or if they all kind of move towards the same direction. They just don't notice each other always, like, pushing them. That'd be interesting. Like... Hey, I want this guy. Uh, hey, my boss kind of wants this guy to live, but your guy's even richer. And he wants this guy to die. Should I just like take this message back to my boss? It's like, won't he kill you? It's like, eh, as long as it's your guy. I don't know. I think that'd be interesting. I, mean, I want to figure out what happened because like at this point we have like four groups trying to like what was it? And I remember through we had that guy who was trying to run the war on terror and apparently been doing other stuff with about it from the past. We have Hydra who's been doing really stuff in the shadows. And what else? We have like one or well, I could have sworn there was like one of the organizations that been movie playing stuff. Regardless, and then we also have these guys. It's like you know, I wonder if they ever get. Oh no, no, no! It was the uh, Soviet people, the um, the evil villain from Bla from uh, Black Widow. Yeah, so there are four now officially four organizations who have been manipulating the world's events from the shadows. And I just wonder if they ever get into fights over who actually gets to manipulate the world's events. Like, do they ever disagree, or do they all just, like, because, you know, they're all evil, they all just kind of push in the way? Although, to be fair, he seems to be mostly interested in power and money and wealth. And less so in running the world. Um, in addition, he kind of turns into a decent character. Like, at first, again, he this plot feels very stock at first. Uh, the characters kind of grow as the plot develops and move away from their original stock character types. So... He is originally, you know, the badass crime lord who's even better at kung fu than his uh, kid or whatever. And instead, it actually turns out that when he married his wife, who comes from this... Okay, this is going to take a bit of explaining. She comes from a, another reality that's guarded by a magic gateway in a forest of bamboo uh, that's constantly moving around. You have to navigate through it. And his, her, his father, uh, the main character's father, uh, when we try to find this hidden, you know, utopia of magic and magical creatures and powerful people who apparently knew some ancient martial arts of the gods, uh, which is basically just airbending. Like, I'm not even joking. It, everything they, the magic martial art that's gifted by the dragons does looks like it's airbending, which, for an Avatar Last Airbender fan, 
is amazing. I love it. Uh, seriously, watch this. It looks like Aang is airbending. And they even made play... Uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Just watch. Uh, oh, small note. Choreography is this movie's strong suit. All the fights are stunning. Every single one of them. They're just amazing. Um, and it, especially a lot of like the martial arts magic stuff. Really loved it. On board for it. I will probably watch this three more times. And I'll probably watch the fights like five more times each. They're just stunning. So, yeah, that's all great. Um, anyway, he goes to the village, you know, but he only finds the... He's led to this, like, small little cove, uh, alcove, where he meets his future wife. Um, and she's like, you're not worthy to the village. They will not allow you to, because, you know, he's, again, an immortal crime lord. Uh, <laughs> and so she ends up fighting with him. And they have this, like, cool, like, dance fight. Like, they start fighting with each other seriously, but then they start almost, like, taking it easy on each other and slowly moving around her slowly evading and weaving through his attacks. And it almost looks like they're dancing at first. And he's, you know, obviously impressed by her. She's the first person who ever beat him. Um, and he eventually comes back and starts getting to know her. And she decides to marry him to try and make him a better person. And she does. That's the twist. He actually did put away the rings. Uh, her, her village still wouldn't allow him to come with her. So she left for the outside world. And he agreed that put aside the rings. Uh... Which, cause the way he said it was, I finally found someone I was willing to grow old with. He had spent all this time using the rings to avoid death, to amass wealth and power, to search for anything he could, and he finally found someone he just wanted to spend his life and grow old together with. Like, he didn't want to outlive her. Of course, since he's, you know, kind of evil in this movie, uh, you can guess how that went. You know, it's, uh, it's also kind of a stock plot, but it grows through depth. Uh, you know, another crime family who he had knocked off. Ends up coming. They kill his wife. Uh, they actually do let his kids walk away. They're, she says, they're not involved in this. It's like, fine. Let them leave. Uh, you know, life for a life, not multiple life for one life. So, that whole thing. Uh, and, of course, he gets really angsty. Puts on the uh, gauntlets again and goes out to kill all them. But he can't find their boss. So, he actually trains his son, the main character, Shang-Chi. Um, and trains him to, uh, you know, kill... The person who killed his mother and uh, when he was wife. So he does for like seven, he takes a seven year old, trains him for seven years till he's 14, and sends him on an assassination mission when he finally finds him. And the twist that you're thinking is like, okay, so this is where he leaves. He sees him with his family or whatever, and he leaves and puts it all down. That's how he gets to like living in San Francisco as a valet with his new best friend. No, actually, he did kill the guy, and then he felt awful about having you know, propagate the same crime he had spent his entire life grieving over. Uh, so he ran away, ashamed of what he had done, even though he had done what his father asked. That's why his father's kind of left him alone, is because he didn't actually betray his father. His father knew where he was, and is getting tired of, you know, listening to him, moping about it. and it's like, it's time for you to do this, I need your help. Um, I'll get to his motivation a little later, but... Yeah. And he told his sister, I'll be back in three days, she waited six years and said, screw you, and ran away from home as well. So, you know, the whole broken family thing. Um, and that's where he's been leading to from when this movie starts. Like, he's working as a valet uh, in San Francisco with Katie, which, you know, she's nice. She's very upbeat, uh, very, like, kind of normal person. She's just like, I just don't want to do anything. I just kind of enjoy being a valet and just living life. And I don't feel like, you know, focusing all my efforts onto something that will just make me miserable. Uh I kind of, I, I liked her. I liked her a lot. She's fun. She reminds me a lot of Darcy, honestly. Um, and obviously, you know, she finds out her friend who she had been with for, you know, they have been best friends for like half his life now. She had met him in like high school um, when he, you know, vanished at the age of 14, made a new identity, went to school, got a degree, all that stuff. And um, she finds all these martial arts and like, all right, fine. We have to do this. Where are you going? I'm coming with you. It's like, wait, what? It's like, yeah, Ninja tried to kill us on a bus, and the bus fight is awesome, by the way. Um, and so I'm coming with you. We're going to find your sister, and we're going to put soul to rest. So she goes with them. Uh, they go find her sister, who's running this, like, fight club in uh, Macau. Wong is, like, her, Wong is one of her champions, and she's, like, you know, the head fighter, uh, in addition to running the whole show. And she beats some catharsis out of him, because she had actually... She, he had come there from a letter, which turned out to be a ruse by his father to get both of them in the same place because he wanted their necklaces, and it's revealed that it'll lead to a map that'll show him how to get into the village. 
uh, his mother's old village. So they do that. Uh, they have this awesome fight scene on the side of the building. And his father ends up saying, I knew my men couldn't kill you, because he appears, of course, with his army. Like, I knew my men couldn't kill you, even if they tried. It's like, I warned them. And, you know, obviously he's the only one that can stop both his kids, so he comes along. he came along to make sure they got caught. And so then they got back, and we find out why, what his whole motivation is. So, recently, he has been content to let his kids, you know, hate him, because he's just feeling off about his life. His wife died, his kids hate him, he drove his son to that revenge, even though he feels like it was the right thing to do. It obviously wasn't, you know, healthy for his son. So he's, he meant, I knew, no, I knew where you were, I just left you alone. You needed time, and I've given you that time. But now is important. So he reveals that the um, his their mother had left the most secret hidden message using magic water. It's complicated uh, to basically a secret uh, map to get them in a uh, path in the forest that'll open up at a specific time and how to go through it. Because it's basically an ever shifting maze. The bamboo moves away to reveal small clearings, and it's constantly moving, constantly shifting. And so, if you want to get through it, you actually have to follow a very specific predetermined path. Or uses other very risky routes on it later. So, yeah. She says, I've been hearing her. Her whispers. I can feel her touch. Uh, and, of course, it's not actually his wife. She thinks that his her whole village has betrayed her and has kidnapped her and brought her there, even though, you know, he saw her die and is holding a prisoner. But it's very clear he's kind of, like, lost himself. Like, he's delusional and just kind of destroyed mentally and is just, like, started hearing his wife again is obsessed with doing it, right? So he wants to find her in her home. They realize something's wrong here and he ends up putting him in prison while he sorts this out. And then they run into Trevor Slattery and OMG, I've never been so happy to see the guy. Okay, for those of you who don't know, Trevor Slattery was, um, okay, so first we had to go back to Iron Man 3. I know this is a long time ago, but... In Iron Man 3, there was a uh, terrorist plot that was targeting Iron Man called called the Ten Rings. Yeah, I know. A lot like the Ten Rings organization in this movie. We'll get to that. And it was run by a shady character called the Mandarin, who sent out spooky videos to mark his terrorist attacks. Turns out it wasn't actually him. He wasn't the real leader of the organization or the real Mandarin, quote-unquote. Um, that guy on the videos was all just an actor by the name of Trevor Slattery. <laughs> The real man- Mandarin was like a tech billionaire that was trying to get back at Tony Stark for various reasons, but it's complicated, not important. But anyway, Trevor had been the public face of the Mandarin. Now, as you can imagine, they had actually been basing their terrorist organization off a, you know, rumored to maybe exist organization that was actually the Ten Rings, the real Ten Rings. And they weren't happy with them co-opting their image and all that stuff, which is kind of like a funny commentary on, you know, co-opting the idea of the spooky Chinese space, space wizard thing that the original Mandarin character from the comics had going on, but I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. So, uh, anyway, the uh, Trevor was basically like a British actor who was just told that he was doing this for, like, you know, a movie or whatever. He wasn't actually told the details. But, you know, since he's associated with the Indians of going to prison, he's like, I found myself in there. I really turned myself around. I'm going to do better in the future. But then these shady guys broke me out of prison and brought me here, and apparently they were supposed to execute me because I had impersonated a really powerful, immortal billionaire. So I kind of panicked and started reciting Macbeth. And it turns out I, they actually really like my acting. So I've been granted a stay of execution so long as I keep them entertained. I've got a new performance tonight. You want me to do over it? He is a riot. He's the best. Uh, then they actually find one of the magical creatures from this, you know, mysterious other dimension that's hidden behind the bamboo forest. And it's like this small, faceless, furry little thing with these, like, uh, bird wings. And Trevor's like, wait, you can see him? Oh, thank goodness. I thought I'd gone insane in here, you know. I haven't seen anyone other than the assassins. They don't talk much for so long. It's like, aren't you glad you're a l- real little buddy? Uh, he can understand the thing somehow when everyone else just hears it, like, grunting and growling. And he's not insane. He actually does apparently hear it because he leads them through this forest uh, into the other world and is able to give them pertinent information. So he definitely does hear it, which is a little weird. Uh, and Trevor's just funny. Actually, during the battle, they have this whole moment where the little guy finds him uh, face down. He's like, Ooh. He's like, shush, I'm just acting. I don't want to get my soul eaten. Uh, and so the little guy's like, 
the, I mean, you're supposed to be like, you know, how dare you? You should go and do something. Instead, the uh, the little thing I forget its name just rolls over his back and plays dead with them. It's like, oh, they weren't made for each other. It's like, it's like, wait, that's actually a really smart idea, Trevor. Yeah, I think I'll join you. <laughs> uh, so that's the best. Anyway, they go there. They find out they've been guarding this ancient evil thing called the ugh, what is it? Um, the Dweller in Darkness. Basically, this mysterious other world actually had a really advanced civilization at one point instead of this small little village. But they're actually the survivors, like the last few hundred years, of a massive demon that wiped out their entire civilization by harvesting their souls to gain power. And it was only thanks to a dragon called the Guardian uh, that they were able to actually seal it away. And they basically had a last ditch stand to prevent it from taking an entire other world with them. So, you know, they were reduced to a small village, and most of their technology was lost to time. But they did have, like, a thriving culture. And I actually like that. It's like, this, you know, ancient civilization has existed in this magical other world for thousands of years. It's like, yeah, but they look, like, less advanced than a thousand-year-old us plus magic. It's like, oh, yeah, so they were a super advanced society that's, like, thousands of years more advanced than us plus magic. But they lost a lot of that when they had to defeat a literal demon that wiped out like 99.99% of their population and reduced them to a small village on the edge of their actual territory. It's like, okay, that's fair. Uh, the dragon's also cool too. It doesn't just like appear as like a, you know, a prop in the background. It actually plays a major role in the battle and does most of the work in actually defeating the evil demon when it's released. Because obviously the demon has been, you know, imitating her voice. Um, I was actually expecting like some sort of stupid connection between the rings and this magical other worlds. Like, they were meant to be, and that's why we could never allow him in. It's like, no, we didn't allow him in, cause your father in, because he was kind of a dick. Uh, and your mother made him better for a while, but when he di she died, he went right back to his old ways, which makes him a little more tragic than evil. But, um, you know, the rings were just a powerful artifact. And apparently, judging from what they said, the demon has called a lot of other people here in the past. Anytime he, the demon senses someone in the other world that has a powerful artifact or some ability that might be able to release it, it will call them with whatever they desire, in this case, the idea that his wife's alive and being held prisoner behind this evil gate, um, to come free him. And of course, he manages to actually do it. He breaks free of this dragon scale seal. Uh, there's this whole bit where dragon scales are used to make all the weaponry. It's cool. The funny sidekick character, Katie, Katie gets to train some archery in the training montage, and she gets to actually do a really decisive blow in the final battle. Him and his son have a nice heart-to-heart. -heart. He ends up uh, giving him his son's rings after, while the thing's ripping his soul out so he can have a fighting chance. He teams up with the dragon, and oh my god, I love the dragon so much, I'm buying that Pop Funko as soon as I can. Uh, sorry. Uh, also, I'm trying to text actually for the dragon, but I love the dragon so much! Like, it's only there for, like, maybe, like, a third, like the last, like, I don't know, six in the movie, but it's just so interesting. So, yeah, that's how all that goes. Um, you know, the battle's fought, everything's nice. They have a few moments that kind of subvert your expectations here a little bit. It's, it's definitely playing towards the typical, you know, martial arts, you know, evil crime family thing and trying to subvert your expectations every once in a while. But I think it works in basically all the ways it attempts to subvert the expectations and still works even without them. Uh, the last little bit, though, is just, like, more MCU world building, but in kind of a fun way. So, obviously, they had this, like, scene where uh, Sh uh, Shang-Chi and uh, Katie, Katie were um, talking with a friend of theirs who got married, and they were talking about, why don't you guys apply yourself? You could do so much more. And they're telling him about this, like, final battle, and they're like, okay, guys, seriously, stop playing a joke on us. You guys are freaking valets, and you expect us to believe you just saved the world. And then, right behind her, Wong starts opening a portal. And it's like, Shang-Chi and Katie Chen. I'm looking for Shang-Chi and Katie Chen. It's like, that's us, that'd be us. It's like, the, the friend is just looking at them like, what the heck? Uh, <laughs> and of course, he brings them there, and Wong starts talking about what anyone who knew about the Ten Rings from the comics... So, Fun fact, the ten rings from the comics are belong to a, like a super villain character who's kind of the arch enemy of Iron Man called the Mandarin. He's kind of a Fu Manchu ripoff, basically. And his whole thing is he had ten rings that each had unique power. Now, at first it was believed the rings are magic, but it's actually revealed later on there's basically just advanced alien technology. Um, and they kind of hinted at this at the end. See, Wong is like, hey, kid, uh, you did save the world. We found out you saved the world recently. And I, don't be, don't get a big head. It's, we've all been there before. 
but we need to look at those artifacts of yours. They've been getting off some weird energy signatures. So they bring them in. It's like, oh, Wong's scanning them. They have Captain Marvel on one screen. They have uh, Bruce Banner on the other. They're talking about, oh, yeah, they're getting off these weird signatures. I've never seen anything like this. Not Chitauri or Kree. Yeah, we'll have to keep a lookout. All right, the rings seem good enough right now. You can keep them. They are yours after all. Um, do keep in contact. We like to keep an eye on any up-and-coming superheroes. Do not understand. You've entered a very weird world, and there's not really a good way back, guys. Sorry about that. But uh, you should be adjusting pretty fine. Let us know if there are any problems. Bruce Banner has my cumber. She, you know, Captain Marvel leaves and like, Bruce like, I don't have her number. She like just likes doing that sometimes. And you really get the sense of like, oh, they're just like looking out for a little young heroes, keeping an eye out for them, you know, looking for new talent uh, and giving them the guidance they might not have had. And I'm like, you know what? That's actually really sweet. I like that. Uh, they also hint that, oh, these are probably aliens. They sent out some strange signals. So maybe whoever made the rings is going to come get them. Uh, which is cool. It's cool. I like it. So, yeah. All in all, it ends really cool, really well. We get some cameos. Wong is a joy as always. The new, the new two, the two new leads are fun. Uh, the sister is in charge of the new assassins now. She's trying to reform them and she has this like punk aesthetic to it with lots of graffiti all over the base now and they're building like satellites and, you know, advancing technologically more so than just having like a really old style, but trying to communicate more with the world. Uh, it looks nice. I, I think they're an interesting. Although they kind of look ambiguous in the end credit scene, whether she's like become the new villain or if she's just actually trying to reform the assassins. So I do want to know where that goes because it was a little ambiguous. I'm leaning on the side of her just like trying to reform them as a force for good. So, you know, where we had the army of wizards and all that stuff show up. The next time they have the big battle, they're going to have the army of ninjas show up to help them out. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's all lots of fun. Pretty cool movie, great choreography, fun characters, a plot that seems standard at first, but subverts your expectations, amazing action scenes, good CGI. What more can you ask for in a good action movie? I mean, seriously, this is a really good one. Uh, I'm not just saying that because I'm starting from Marvel content, because I already watched Black Widow, and I've watched all these shows, and I'm like, no, Shang-Chi is probably one of the best things that's come out this year uh, in the recent Marvel stuff. The only thing I might have liked more than it was WandaVision, and that's just because WandaVision was so unique and interesting. Uh, just this complete breath of fresh air. But aside from WandaVision, yeah, this is probably the best thing Marvel's released this year. Gotta hand it to them. Love it. Uh, cannot wait to see the sequel to this. Like, seriously, I actually really like these two leads. They're very fun together. Uh, they have this recurring joke that whenever, like, they're like, you know, we should go home and get some rest. But, karaoke night! Uh, it's just like, oh, they're, they, they seem like fun. They're procrastinating, not taking things too seriously. But at the same time, when you know, it needs to get serious. They don't suddenly have, like, tragic moments, quite frankly. Uh, that's the best way I can describe it. They have a very natural chemistry together, and I do genuinely want to see them in the future. Especially since Katie is now, like, a, you know, trained as an archer, and I wonder if she's going to start getting her own skills in the next movie if they do it. You know, he's got the ring, she has the bow, that kind of stuff. It'll be interesting to see. But, uh, yeah, I hope you guys like the new longer videos. As you can see, this one is, like, 30 minutes long. That's because I decided to spring for a few extra hours each month. So, yeah, hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you want to support us, you can just check out the Buy Me a Coffee page linked in the show notes. Um, you can also just, you know, email me if you got any questions. I'd really like to hear some feedback from you guys. We have a new Facebook page up. You can find that in the show notes as well. Uh, check out our website. You know, follow us on Twitter at dragon underscore library two. Just send me a message. If you want me to review something, just let me know. Um, I will, I'm currently reading Dune and looking to watch the movie, the old movie before the new one comes out this, uh, October. So look forward to a Dune week retrospective. Uh, gosh, I've only gotten like halfway through the first book, but it's really good so far. Really excited for it. So look forward to that in the future. See you guys next time. Bye. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode and thank you for listening to the Dragon's Library. Please, subscribe to this podcast to be notified of new episodes. The Dragon's Library releases new episodes Tuesday and Friday each week. And you can follow us on Twitter at dragon underscore library 2. If you want to suggest an episode topic, my email is in the description below. And as always, thank you so much for all your support.